welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to uh, the Spotlight Series on uh, Sundays uh, with uh, Community Works Institute. Um, Joe Brooks is the director of CWI and it is a really cool program uh, for K through 12 and K through 16 educators to um, do community-based work, uh, ethnography, and they do some really cool um, uh, conferences that, that folks should check out their website to get interested in. And I am Zach Ritter. Uh, I am uh, Associate Dean of Students at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And I am also a diversity consultant and uh, uh, just dedicated to getting folks to think outside the box create creatively about what they can do to make a positive impact in their community and what better person to bring on the show, the Spotlight Series show today than Dr. Adrian. Martinez. Um, so you are a registered nurse, you are a PhD. There were some things after your name that I didn't even know existed, but you're going to educate the folks today about what the, those things mean. You're also um, uh, a researcher at UCLA in the what is it, NCSP um, program. So, so tell the folks all these different hats that you wear. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's always good to see you. Yeah. Uh, so my current position is a postdoctoral fellowship. It's usually training that you do after you get your PhD to just um, hone your skills in, in some aspect of research and to continue whatever it is that you were studying with your PhD and just kind of move that science forward. Um, so I'm actually very lucky to be part of the National Clinician Scholars Program, which is what NCSP is at UCLA. This is a national program that is sort of an offshoot of the Robert Wood Johnson's um, Fellowship, which has been around for 50 years, a fantastic policy-based two-year program, and they just started letting in registered nurses. Traditionally, for the last 48 years, something like that, it's mostly been physicians, um, but now they're letting in nurses with PhDs, and they are uh, across the country, right? So we're at UCLA, Penn, Michigan, Yale, Duke. Um, there's one now at UCSF. And the idea is that you get this rigorous policy training in addition to collaborating with people across the country to address some specific social injustice related to health, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole program is about health equity um, and it's been really fulfilling. Because mm -hmm. um, you're looking specifically at, at burnout from diabetes? Yeah, so I have a long history of studying diabetes from when I was in my master's program at Charles Drew University, and I kind of rolled that into a PhD that was examining uh, just experiences seeking care among older Latina women with diabetes, um, because they are disproportionately impacted um, in terms of diagnosis, but also in terms of outcomes. And what I found was that most of the women wanted to talk to me about their care seeking experiences. So how they actually experience the healthcare system and in particular, their interactions with their provider. And some of the stories I have to tell you were pretty horrific. Um, mm -hmm. These were all Medi-Cal or uninsured folks um, and they were all 60 and over. And so they'd had the lifetime experience of seeking uh, healthcare in historically under-resourced communities. And I was so shocked by the stories that I heard. And there was such a disconnect between what I know of my physician friends and how well-meaning and how devoted they've been for decades of their lives to do this work and what I was told was being said to these women, how they were treated. So I really dove into this concept of depersonalization. How does a person get to a place where they treat other humans with so much disregard, uh, especially when they're suffering? Um, and depersonalization is a big aspect of burnout. Right. So I started looking at provider burnout and understanding um, what sort of, you know, support systems or kind of reinforcement of original purpose is lacking in the way we educate and maintain our healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. And um, and how can we make it better? I think ultimately, if we improve providers experiences, make sure they have the mental and physical and emotional support they need, you really improve care delivery services in the safety net. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. I want to come back to your work in uh, medicine, but I would be remiss uh, to not ask the director of CWI, Joe Brooks, uh, is, is always interested in your mural work. Tell us a little bit about your mural work. So I started 
started painting murals uh, with my mom actually when I was, I don't know, maybe six, mm. seven, eight, something like that. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. And one of the ways that we would make money around the holidays is that we would go to local businesses and offer to paint, you know, happy holidays, 50% off or whatever you did on store windows. Um, and so it really took away the fear of creating public art in my young brain. And kind of from then on, I would do murals like in college or other places because why not, right? I didn't have any formal art training, but it's nice to, to get some stuff up. As I started doing research, I realized that this public art is not only really um, a fantastic vehicle for getting some health messaging out there, but is a fundamental part of Latino culture in, in Mexico and also in Southern California where I live. And so I wanted to use murals as health-based interventions to encourage positive behavior. So the first project that I did as a Schweitzer Fellow here in Los Angeles was I wanted to address the the social appropriateness of exercise among Latina women. There, there are some cultural taboos around publicly exercising. And so we did a big mural project where we got women together and they brought their whole families and grandkids. And we talked about what sort of exercises are appropriate. And then we depicted those on three large murals at a local community center and church, um, just to have them up so that we can kind of start the conversation of is it normal for you to be out getting exercise with your your kids and you know your family how does that help alleviate some of the uh, diabetes symptoms that you're experiencing and then prevent diabetes in the long term right mm. so so that was kind of the first big project but i've used a number of um, mural based interventions in my research and uh, I find it to be really fulfilling because, you know, science can be kind of lonely and it, a lot of it, it sounds kind of fun and sexy, but a lot of it happens in your room on a data analytics program and being able to connect with my local community and hear what's important to them and help them depict what's important to them, I think is, is just a, a huge part of what keeps me interested in this kind of work. Right, right. No, I love that. And uh, yeah, that's interesting about whatever this kind of a shame or or, or um, uncomfortableness of certain you know communities not wanting to exercise in public is an interesting thing to to analyze but but you and I nerd out about this as academics because we're like yo sometimes people don't read our stuff but someone's going to look at this mural right and so how do you make uh, this research not only action research but public research and I think that's even what led me to do like this show like I talked to Joe and I was like it's COVID. I want to, you know, get interesting people to talk on 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 a computer screen about this stuff. Um, so, all right, I want to ask you a lot of stuff because you're a really cool person. You're, yeah. you're one of the most brilliant people I know. So, um, and and we just happened to meet at at someone's like you know apartment party. Um, we just yeah, another fellow. She's an amazing amazing uh, surgeon who is part of the, um, the NCSP fellowship. I, I'm so grateful that she introduced us. Yeah, and so actually, maybe we should start there. You have a knack for connecting people and you just invite people over your house that are um, you know, younger in their journey, who are older in their journey, and you are a big proponent of mentee-mentorship relationships. Tell me a little bit about that. And also, was there a mentor in your life that kind of propelled you? Sure, although these are big questions, which is why you're getting soliloquies as responses. But um, I, so I come from a, a really big family and um, you know, Southern California, Mexican family, big and loving and warm, which gives you the sense that there's somebody connected to you that can make stuff happen. So before you just go get new tires, you should talk to your Uncle Timber, something like that, right? And so I think that aspect of me felt very lonely in academia. So there are, of all the registered nurses that get a PhD, there's about 4 million registered nurses in the country, about 1% pursue doctoral level education. And of that 1%, less than half of 1% are Latina of any kind, wow. right? So it's very underrepresented. And so it's nobody's fault, but when you go to a doctoral program, the idea that you're gonna have a tenure track person who can mentor you, who is also a Latina or understands where you're from, is just almost more than you could hope for. Right. And so I created this student research collective 
based on my experiences as a kid of like, let's just all hang out. Um, it's called Theory Generator Playground. And that was kind of my first uh, introduction to this world of you can amass collaborators and build relationships and start kind of peer mentoring. And as our first cohort of people started kind of growing up more and we graduated, we've continued to mentor people below us in this research collective. So I do have parties, I host events, I do social media, um, YouTube channel and Facebook, just to make sure that anyone who's remotely interested gets the support that they deserve. Hmm. You know, I didn't, I didn't do so well that this track was direct from high school to college to master's to PhD. I'm not one of those people, but I feel like I have a lot to offer, especially in terms of health equity and man, it would have all been gone if I hadn't had a couple people willing to help me out mm. or willing to tell me it's okay to get C's sometimes your first run out. Some, we all drop classes. It's not the end of the world, right? Like there's so much pressure as a first gen college student and as somebody who is racially or ethnically not like the other people around you, mm. that man, without mentors, I'm amazed that we're even as diverse as we are. Mm. So, um, so I am very connected to Charles Drew University, which mm. is a historically Hispanic and historically black graduate school in South LA. And, you know, I went there for my master's, but I continue to stay connected to them because it took until I went into a master's program with an understanding of what this is like for me to even consider doing the stuff I do now, mm. because I got consistent support from people who told me it was okay when I didn't actually do very well and we'll get over it and who recognize that if you are low income first gen a woman all of these other things your experience is multifaceted and school is just one little facet mm. man you got so many other things going on mm. and so i really try to carry forth that spirit that i had at, at cdu which is like man a rising tide raises all boats this is not a zero-sum game as many of us as we can get into these spaces that really promote equity um let's do it mm. right mm. why do you think there is a lot of systemic racism within the medical field honestly i think the whole idea uh, have you heard of a ph me or an me no. So the PhD degree, um, the reason it's a PH me and same thing with a, a medical doctor is that you only know what you know, mm -hmm. and people tend to study things that have personally impacted them, any field that you're in, right? So if you're an astronomy doctorate, you're studying astronomy because maybe your grandpa took you outside in the backyard and then, you know, and you guys would look through the telescope and he would share things with you and it was meaningful. Or if you study Alzheimer's, it's because maybe somebody in your family had Alzheimer's and it really affected you. The work we do is too hard to just do it based on intellectual curiosity. And that's true for any scientist. There is a personal reason why we do it. Hmm. You can't do health equity work if you've never had the experiences of health injustice in the same way. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really important work being done by allies, but I think that you're always going to have a deficit of focus on, you know, basically intersectionality that impacts social determinants of health, unless you get people who have lived it, yeah. right? I study diabetes because almost everybody in my family has diabetes, including me. They're mm -hmm. wonderful people. I've lost my grandpa, my father, my brother's on full-time dialysis now. This stuff has affected every moment of my life. And it's a reflection of our lack of resources, honestly, and a lack of safe spaces to exercise and all of these other things that made us who we are today. Mm. So if you want real health equity, you need to get people into positions where they can speak their truth. Mm. And the only way we get those people there is if we recognize that it's not a straight shot. Sometimes mm. they need you know, some hands mm -hmm. up, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you, I mean, you not only walk the walk, you talk the talk um, or vice versa, because you, you, I could see you're always connecting uh, people at, you know, through your social gatherings, but also just, uh, you were even on that call the uh, last week, right? And you were talking about yeah, t tell us a little bit about that project you were working on. 
with with different murals and 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 that was really fascinating yes so the two main topics that i'm concerned about right now um are covid related right because all of my burnout work and my secondary trauma work is kind of pivoted to account for covid because everything we knew is different and that's and that's true for most of us across the fields but vaccine hesitancy is a real threat right there is a, a not unfair mistrust of the scientific community in these communities of color because they've been historically experimented on they have been um you know used as kind of the litmus test for whether things are safe they have not necessarily had the resources that um, allow them to equitably access things that are safe so of course there's going to be some mistrust mm -hmm. right and there's a lot of messaging out there that is confusing if you don't have an advanced degree and nobody should have to talk about can anybody explain to me the difference between using mRNA and not? Mm. Like, can you talk to me about a, a attenuated virus? What does that even mean? Mm. Using these big words to scare people and allows them to kind of roll it into con conspiracy theories, basically, is perfectly normal for a group that already doesn't trust you, mm. right? Everybody is so, you know, really displaced by COVID that this seems like one more threat. So addressing vaccine hesitancy is really important to me. And I'm trying to look at using some sort of public art to kind of, in a nonverbal way, get the message out that this is how we end the pandemic. This is how we stop social distancing and the damage it's done to our economy and our relationships with each other, right? Mm -hmm. This is our best hope. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so vaccine hesitancy is a big one. The other one, which is very personal to me is that Funerals are super spreader events. Mm -hmm. And I personally, I'm sorry, I'm gonna plug in my computer real quick. I personally have had four people that I know that are um, three of them close to me and one of them kind of uh, a friend from high school who've passed away in this window. Um, I've never had another year in my life where four people have passed away. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine that I'm alone. Hmm. I do know that at one funeral I attended, uh, an entire family who also attended was sick with COVID hmm. almost immediately after. Hmm. Um, funerals are super spreader events. But in my culture, it's disrespectful to not show up and be there. Hmm. As a matter of fact, when someone's sick, there is this concept of just like, you know, being there sitting in the room, you know, kind of like sharing space with them. Mm -hmm. And all of that's off the table now. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at some public art projects that really get the word out about how do we celebrate life safely mm -hmm. so that we don't continue to compound these funerals with other tragedies, mm -hmm. right? And in the same way, what sort of adaptations can we do or make to the rituals that we have? of how we celebrate birth, because I've actually had two friends give birth during COVID. Um, you know, how do we celebrate that? How do we celebrate death? Mm -hmm. And how do we maintain our relationships with each other in a way that feels like there's still meaning, even if you can't hold someone? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, part of what makes art an ideal vehicle here is that it's nonverbal hmm. and it allows for your own interpretation and I talk, talk, talk. I'm one of those people that like talk, 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 talk. Um, and sometimes about these deeply meaningful things, we need to just shut up and give people some space to feel things. Um, so I would love to create something that facilitates that. Mm. Tell us about your, your battle with COVID. Oof. COVID is terrible, y'all. Do not recommend zero stars. <laughs> Um, I, I was very lucky, honestly, to be, to be completely honest with you, my experience with COVID opened my eyes to the privilege that I have. Um, so I got COVID early at the end of February. I was, um, very sick for about a month and a half. Um, I am in internal medicine at UCLA, right? So I had the best care that a person could get. I was diagnosed with a moderate case. Normally they would have you go in, but this was early enough in the pandemic. We had no idea what to do with people. We didn't, we were still thinking it was a respiratory disease. We just didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so I was uh, virtually seen at least once a day by, you know, some leading internal medicine people. I was given everything that you can get at, or that you could get at that time to help you. Even so, um, I would say 
like everyone at that 14th day, it was a, uh, when are we going to call the ambulance? Mm -hmm. We're going to just kind of keep it on the ready. Um, anyway, but I, you know, I did get over it. I will say that I was actively sick for a month and a half, but it took three months for my, my mental capabilities to return. I was having a hard time speaking. I couldn't read anything. Um, I was writing totally unintel uh, unintelligible things. I think I was telling you guys about that. Um, there was a, a major neurological component for me. And I really believed that I was gonna have to change careers Oof. because I was having a hard time even imagining how I could be a researcher with my new brain um, at that point. Um, but, you know, again, I got, I got lucky and I'm here, uh, but it's so hurtful. Well, you know, the one thing I'm going to mention, though, is that I'm seeing a lot of survivor's guilt for the people in healthcare who get COVID, but can't go actually help on the front lines. Mm -hmm. Because there's been some some odd counterintuitive data about healthcare providers during COVID where this has really galvanized people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just felt this, they felt this resurgence of purpose. And like, this is exactly what we trained for. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's been a little long now, so that adrenaline has kind of worn off. But for the people who really wanted to help but couldn't because they were sick, um, this really affected a lot of people emotionally very deeply. And um, and I remember so when I was at my sickest, but also COVID was was peaking, um, I created this haiku project on Facebook where I oh, my goodness, I'm very sorry about that. No, you're good. It's my really mom. Um, so I, I actually just asked people to submit COVID related haiku and I did it across all of my pages and I'm on a lot of healthcare professional pages. Um, and many, many of them were about things that you would expect, like a lack of PPE and feeling like administration was making financial decisions instead of like humanist decisions. But a lot of it was poems of, of feelings of guilt and feelings of inadequacy for the people who were at home. Wow. Um, so, you know, there's always so many aspects of an experience that you don't think about unless you live it. Um, but yeah, no, I, was, I was lucky. You were saying before the, we um, got into this Zoom session that uh, it was affecting some of your closest relationships, you know, even your marriage, because you said you were, your brain was operating at a very slow level and people around you who love you was like, wow, this is not the... Adrian, I know. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in, in any relationship, people get used to the you that they see all the time. Right. And um, my husband, who is, you know, he's brilliant and wonderful, and we're very much in love, but all of a sudden, he had somebody who essentially had traumatic brain injury. Right. And, um, and my daughter had somebody for several, like a month and a half, who couldn't prepare a single meal, who mm -hmm. had a hard time walking from a, you know, a couch to the kitchen. And all of a sudden becoming that sort of burden on people who are used to kind of the high energy Adrian mm. was challenging, mm. right? And it, it really forced us all to kind of renegotiate what our relationships meant. Mm. And, um, you know, and that's, you're not always ready for that, especially if it's just kind of thrown at you, so. Yeah. Right, no, completely. Um, well, we're glad you're, you're, you're back to your old self and that, and that you're able to now help others. For viewers that are watching, that are confounded about, you know, why is this, is, is COVID racist? You know, why is it going after so many black and brown folks, right? <laughs> like, so tell, tell us why COVID is killing and affecting uh, Latinx folks and black folks um, at, a, at a higher rate than, than white folks. I, that's such a good question because I've actually seen a lot of people post, like, is this a virus racist? And if it is, then where, how did that get programmed? And um, the virus isn't racist, but our society and our societal structures fundamentally are. Yeah. And so certain things, aspects of who you are can make you much more likely to contract the virus, much more likely to be hospitalized and much more likely to die. Yeah. Right. And not coincidentally, those things are the social determinants of health. Right. Okay. So your economic stability, for example, do you have to go to the grocery stores or can you order delivery for all of your food? Mm -hmm. Right. That that is a class issue. Right. Because if you have to go to grocery stores, you're more likely to get it. Right. Um, do you are you an essential worker? Right. In other words, are you providing um, customer service at a place where you're seeing a lot more people? Right. 
um, you're much more likely to get it than if you're somebody who can stay at home, who doesn't have to show up physically at work and can order everything off Amazon, right? Now, these things don't sound like race, but race is a proxy. It's not about race because actually the genetic basis of race is like, you know, spurious of that. The issue is that race in this country is correlated to how much wealth you've managed to accumulate, the level of education that you've been able to attain, which is, you know, leveraged into the type of position or job that you're able to hold. So if you are upper middle class and you're working at a job where you can work from home and you're ordering all of your groceries and you're not physically have to go anywhere and not having to go anywhere, um, you're less likely to get COVID. But guess what? You're also much more likely to be Caucasian. Mm. So it's not about race. It's about the fact that we have systematically disenfranchised African-American people, Latino people, uh, Pacific, uh, well, Asian, Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian people, right? Different groups that have historically never had access to these things. Mm -hmm. So that's just one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is there is actually a correlation between, so there's a connection between a comorbidity, like something that you suffer from before, like asthma, diabetes, obesity, right? These things, hypertension, which are disproportionately so greater experience of that in certain communities because of lack access, a lack of access to healthy food, you know, um, lack of clean air restrictions mm -hmm. that have been passed in certain areas, right? Those happen to be connected to races and ethnicities, mm -hmm. and the the diagnoses that I just mentioned, right? Obesity, asthma, hypertension, diabetes are also connected to a five times greater increase in chance of hospitalization. Yeah for COVID, right? This is CDC numbers, this isn't me. So there's a lot of science behind this and it's hard to kind of make it um, sound short and sweet, but the short and sweet answer is the virus isn't racist, but our societal structures are. Yeah. And if we want to make sure that we are providing equal access to healthcare and equal support, then we need to recognize that there's certain communities who really do need a stimulus, for example, to stay home. Mm. Right. And those people are heroes who are in the hospitals providing care and honestly at the Foods for Less down the street who showed up every day to make sure that they are checking and bagging groceries. These people are heroes, right. but they shouldn't be sacrificial workers. Right. 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 And that's kind of how we're treating them. And yeah, it's a it's a class issue and, and a race issue just because race is tied to class. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, 100 percent. What made you want to jump from being a nurse to being, uh, you know, like a researcher, PhD professor person? Um, a couple of things. One is that I have a busy mind and, um, and actually I don't know that that benefits me on the floor. Interesting. Uh, when you work on the floor, nurses are amazing human beings who have, you know, a tremendous amount of education and specifically tailored in, uh, education to make decisions in the moment that are life and death decisions. And they do it all day, every day. And if you are an overthinker, like I am kind of obviously an overthinker, when you see something happening, you're thinking about the 50 possibilities of the things that you've read about that could be happening right now. But what you really need to do is give the epi shot now, right? And yes. so I have never been a great on the floor nurse for med surge. Like when you're actually doing physical care, I love patients. Um, and I will do all of the, like I love washing patients hair and like doing their nails and like, you know, washing their feet. Like I'm happy to do all of that. Um, but when it comes to the higher level decision-making that needs a very calm, rational, reasoned perspective, it's not where I shine. Um, and I have some friends who this is their space and they are, you know, glowing gods in that space. For me though, I'm a very good psych nurse, I think, because I have a lot of empathy and I love connecting to people and understanding how I can keep them safe. Um, and I love research because it is about creating new knowledge that is then leveraged for these evidence-based practices that the, you know, the nurses on the floor can use to make quick decisions. Mm. So that's kind of, that's what it's about. And in a larger sense, my kind of philosophy on life, which is that I feel like I have a purpose. Like mm -hmm. I, all of the experiences I've had in my life 
have felt like there was a purpose for me. And I continue to follow it in the direction that allows me to help the most people and contribute to our species because we have a limited time on earth. So what can you do to help other humans while you're here by leveraging the best of who you are? Um, and you know, you're always chasing after it. You never get there. But, um, but for me, that's research. Mm, that was a lot right there. <laughs> it's always a lot. I know I told you. <laughs> You, no, you probably would have liked COVID brain, Adrian. I was no, no, <laughs> no, because I've never heard someone put it like that. Because I have thought that you only have a limited amount of time on this earth. How are you going to make the biggest impact? I've been watching small acts, you know, on Amazon Prime, which is about Caribbean, Jamaican, Black folks in in, in Britain in the eighties, and and just it's this interesting notion that. It's a Bob Marley song that if we're all small acts, axes and, and systemic racism, sexism, classism, all these structures are big trees, then the song goes, if you're a big, big tree, then a small axe ready to cut you down, right? And yeah. so how do we cut down some of these toxic trees? And you're saying, on the floor, I was passionate about it, but my, you, you're very introspective. And you're like, I don't even know if I was the best nurse because I was thinking about all these other things and maybe I should be on some other uh, level doing some, some research that's gonna impact people. And I actually got into it with my last guest because they were saying that you can make, we were talking about policy versus mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And I was making the argument that both are ne necessary, obviously. Ah, absolutely. But, right. But you can make a bigger impact shaping policy. And, and, and she rightfully so was pushing back on me. But do you, do you like, what's it like for you to affect policy in medicine? Can I, can I cuss on here? Is this one of those stations we try to do PG-13? I think I think hierarchies are, are bullshit. Yeah. I think that pretending like one kind of nurse is more important than another kind of nurse holds us all back. I think we need people who are um, CNAs who are doing a lot of the hands on care and really, really delivering the classic nursing, which is empathy and, uh, you know, caring for other humans. I also think we need the nurses who are surgical nurses and, you know, and I think we need research nurses and and in medicine nursing is the only field the only field in healthcare actually that is holistic so we care not just about the disease process a lot of these other fields are about fighting the disease and winning and not letting people die that's not us nursing is about holistic well-being mental spiritual emotional physical health sexual health death and dying really all of this is about us helping you live your best life Mm -hmm. Not this abstract best life, but like, what is for you based on your decisions and how can I help you get there? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think when we talk about, you know, different roles that people have in policy and practice and all of this other stuff, we're creating these ridiculous boxes and ranking that hold us back as a species. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and frankly, that sort of hierarchy kind of BS is one of the reasons that we don't think essential workers who are like, you know, working in grocery stores, et cetera, are as important as the nurses providing care. Right. Um, and that's wrong, right. right? We need to stop judging other people's occupation and recognize that we're all part of our society, this mm -hmm. society that we're all trying to have. There's no, anybody's better than anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate that compensation is tied to our positions. I know I'm kind of veering off here. Um, yep. No, but no. I think, you know, I think that's problematic. The, the one other thing I wanted to say, because you mentioned a song, check out John Craigie, fantastic okay. folk singer, love John Craigie. Huh. I often think of this one song that he wrote called Jesus Years. And mm -hmm. one of the lines in there is, you never know who's writing shit down during your Jesus years, right? And Jesus was walking around doing important stuff, changing people's lives and things, but other people were documenting it. Mm -hmm. And I always think, 50% of anything I do, any social justice work I do is the thing. Yeah. And 
is all the people who see me do it. Wow. And maybe it changes some little part of their heart or mind, right. or maybe it's some kid who didn't know that you could do that. Right. Like it is about the forward and backward legacy, I think. Mm -hmm. And that makes you feel better when stuff doesn't work out. Because a lot of these projects, they don't work out. You know, we only talk about the stuff that's like, oh, I'm in the newspaper and that's awesome. But you didn't hear about the four grants that I didn't get, right? <laughs> um, so it keeps me going to believe that half of it is just the doing. Mm. And the seeing. And the seeing, right? Yeah. I'm so inspired by my peers. And, um, and sometimes this is lonely work, mm -hmm. you know, because if you really believe in this stuff, it breaks your heart. And it's important to be able to connect with people whose hearts are also broken so that you can talk about what's so dispiriting. And then you can also share triumphs from people who really understand what it took to get there. Mm. I want to get into your K through 16 experience and talk about some of the people that that encouraged you there, but also. Um, well, it's not going to be a good story. I'll OK, so OK, so. <laughs> So tell me about it, even if it's not a good story uh, or it's a sad story, and then and then I have a follow up. Yeah, I mean, you know, kindergarten was was fine. Um, I actually was not singled out into a gate program, which is what we they probably call it. Uh, I don't know what they call it now, not special ed, but it's like the honors stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really angry that I wasn't. So I. I think this was maybe fourth grade because the gate kids got to go to these special painting exhibits and they had little passes that would let you get out. So I went to the office and I was like, hey, how does a person get into this gate program, gifted and talented education? And they were like, oh, your parents fill out a form and they pull up, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, go ahead and give it to me. Hmm. And so my mom uh, was an amazing woman, worked full time and we actually didn't get to see her very much because she was really struggling to just put food on the table. And so I filled out the application myself in a very self-righteous way. And I took it back to the, um, to the office and I got in. Mm. And it was my first time feeling separated from kind of the, you know, the hoi polloi, like the mm. masses where I'm special. <laughs> and, um, and I've had a lot of experiences in my life where people have done that to me and for me, mm. not just because... I do well in school generally, but honestly, because I'm a Latina woman mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm in my mid forties now. So back when I was in junior high, there wasn't a lot expected of Latina women mm -hmm. uh, unfairly, mm -hmm. but there wasn't. So mm -hmm. I heard a lot of things like you're a credit to your race. Mm -hmm. um, you should do good things because Mexicans don't do many good things, wow. stuff like that. That is, it's kind of weird to hear now, but at the time as a kid, you just take it in stride. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm light skinned which is different than some of my family. It's uh, different than my brother who has had a very different experience in life with the education system. Um, and, and people are racist and systems are racist. So I always felt like I've been given extra, you know, like I'm wearing lifts in my shoes. I, I get extra little special everything in school. Mm. Um, and that's good and bad mm. because it, I didn't really learn how to study until I was deep into college. Like my, you know, my grades weren't spectacular. Nobody really actually cared about who I was. It was like an identity and that's a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. yeah, you know, again, it, it wasn't like, wow, you, you're great. Let's give you all of these different opportunities. It was like, hey, Martinez, you're great. Let's give you these opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because what I see now um, at the place I am in my career, is that I'm often invited to speak about things that have nothing to do with my research. Mm. They have to do with, you know, can you come talk about being a Latina researcher or a Latina nurse or, you know, a Latina who set up mentorship programs and all of those things are important. Mm. But man, what if I was a physicist? I would be really bummed if people only invited me to come talk because I was like a Latina physicist and they never wanted to learn about like my new concept of reality, like that would suck. <laughs> so, um, so I try to provide the support for students when they need it, but I also try to make sure that there is a space for them to just be scientists, you know, just be interested in the actual science and how can we get you to where you get to be somewhat race and ethnicity and class neutral yeah. and math is math. Um, and I think that's really hard for K through 12 people. 
because they don't have one student, they've got 30, you know, if they're lucky, sometimes they've got more. Mm. And how do you undo that legacy mm. of like, you know, nobody says you're a smart kid. They say you're a smart black kid. Mm. And all those sort of qualified compliments. Right. Um, seems like they're helping, but they're not. Right, right, right. What is uh, advice you would give to teachers K through 12, K through 16 to change some of this stuff that you had to go through? You know, in COVID, I wouldn't give them any advice. I would just be like, keep on trucking. You all are amazing. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, I can't even imagine the amount of pivoting that's been required of K through 12 educators without, I suspect, any sort of compensation. Um, and teachers we know are already spending a huge amount of their paycheck just making up for the deficits in their budget anyway. So, uh, you know, they don't need to hear anything from me. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would probably say to smart kids out there now, teaching um, is often looked down on, um, especially at the younger grades when you're, you're talking like K through three. It's at least when I was growing up and sometimes I hear people badmouth it really horribly about it being kind of babysitting. Uh, which is absolutely not the case, right? You've got the most fertile minds in the most important period of their lives. Um, if you're a smart kid and you you have empathy and you care about these issues, think about being a teacher. Seriously thinking about being a teacher is a huge contribution to our society. Mm. Um, we don't have enough of them. And mm. if you don't want to be a teacher because that's not your field, man, lobby for them to be compensated fairly because they are not, I mean, they should be making physician salaries for the amount of time and energy, the 24 hour expectations um, that are that are on them. Mm. So. Be being a, a mother, how in this moment in time, is it is it different being a mother right now? <sighs> yeah, I mean, so I have a 16 year old daughter who is an athlete. That's her identity, and um, and rightly so. She's an amazing athlete, multi-sport. Um, and what actually goes into being an athlete is, you know, dedication and hard work. But actually, there's a tremendous amount of time, unstructured, non-verbal time with other kids your age for bonding and emotional support, and all of that's gone. Mm. Um, and so it's been really challenging making sure that my daughter is still in a space where she's interacting with other kids as much as she was before, or at least as much as we can do as before, just for the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, kids are going through a lot. And for me, yeah, people love it if their kids get straight A's and they go to Harvard and then they go to med school and they do whatever. But for me, I don't, I think milestones are kind of bullshit. I think we make them up and I think that every kid is different. So for me, you have to survive mm -hmm. first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've done a lot, I think, during this window. I include her in, in a lot of my activist stuff. I think you saw we, um, she actually designed t-shirts to raise money for the people who were, um, you know, during the BLM protests, there was a lot of violence against uh, protesters and even, even media people. Mm -hmm. And so some first, um, first responders, so nurses and physicians and, and others were going to these protests with kits, emergency kits, just to provide care in the moment and triage because mm. some of the injuries uh, were pretty serious but without funding mm. so my daughter and i designed some t-shirts that we could sell to raise money to fund these uh, emergency groups that were going to provide medical care right so i've done a lot of those kind of little things with her to kind of keep her re-engaged we did some black lives uh, matter murals in downtown mm. la just like keep her in this space and as much as she wants experience the zeitgeist of all of the trauma that's happening right now but in a way that makes you feel like you have some control over it. Hmm. And honestly, I think when you're an activist, you have more of a sense of control than you would if you were just kind of a victim or at least just a passive person experiencing it. You're able to take back some, some power. So, um, so that's hmm. been my, my primary management strategy. Hmm. It, it is, it's a weird time. I, um, yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. I remember those, those, uh, t-shirts and that was really cool that y'all did that um and small yeah small acts right the small acts hey the small <laughs> act. and i went to the black lives matter protest and someone really got effed up and they were yeah. bleeding and it was it was really i mean they had to bring in an ambulance it was pretty disgusting um what oh man i was gonna ask you a good question and now it's slipping my brain um <laughs> how are you doing you doing okay 
Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm kind of getting antsy and I want to like do stuff and, and get out of the house and, and, you know, I've been reading, oh, this is what I want to ask you. I've been reading Obama's book, A Promised Land. Uh, yeah. And um, there's a lot of pushback on Obama now that, you know, he bombed too many people with the drone stuff and he didn't do enough and, and all this stuff. Although he only had one and a half years with the Democratic House and Senate. We right. But my friend who's a, a doctor or studying to be a doctor, she said, yeah, but he also gave, he also delivered 20 million people healthcare, which I agree. I agree. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. Um, are you... Are you hopeful for a Biden administration and, and or how do, we, how do we do the single payer thing? So before I went into research, I came from a health insurance background. So mm. Right after my master's, I um, was the head of case management, capitation and utilization for a Brady Children's Hospital, which was, uh, that worked at Chalk, which is Chalk Orange County. Um, and then I actually had a position as a national nurse lead for Oscar Insurance, which is a tech-based insurance company, kind of managing this stuff. Hmm. There is an awful lot of high paying jobs linked to insurance as is. Yeah. So it is a little difficult for me to envision the yeah. actual implementation of this. Yeah. But I will say that when I was, cause I, I often maintain a floor job too, that I'll do like one day a week or something like that, just to keep my, my clinical chops up. But when uh, Obamacare was passed, we saw a huge difference in the health of our patients coming in. So I work at a psych hospital that is a Medi-Cal and Short Doyle, which is undocumented or indigent funds to cover people who are primarily homeless. Mm -hmm. um, we got a lot of kids that were trafficked, you know, difficult population, um, wonderful people, but difficult like life circumstances. Just with the passage of Obamacare, people were coming in having not skipped their hypertension medication for 30 days, right? They were just coming in healthier, even though they were there for an acute psychiatric crisis, overall their health was better, mm -hmm. right? And seeing that difference was so night and day that if you talk to any nurse or doctor working in a community clinic before and after, they will tell you hands down, it's what we need. We need there to be some option, a public option. We need there to be access to insurance that stops people from doing basic preventive care. And I don't really care what it is. I, I, you know, I'm in my policy program. I talk to these people from Rand and I talk like the big people at Cedars. Like there's all these like famous, amazing people that can talk to you about this. Yeah. All I care about is in the wealthiest goddamn country. Right. We should not be in a position where anybody yeah. doesn't have the necessities of life. Yeah. Right. It is, it's criminal. Yeah. Um, and there's so many ways to fund it yeah. that the money isn't the issue. So I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I'm one of those people who is like UBI for all. Right. I think that everybody should, if they want, have, you know, even a subsistence living situation where they've got a roof with their, over their heads and food and, you know, basic insurance, just because I don't, I can't think of a really good justification why we don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I have yet to actually talk to somebody who can make a non-capitalist argument for it. Mm -hmm. And as a head, seriously, let me just throw this out there. As a head of utilization for a country, uh, for an insurance company, it's cheaper to do it the right way the first time. It's cheaper to do preventive care, always. Mm -hmm. So even people's economic arguments just fall flat for me. Yeah. Um. So yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. I completely agree. What is something that you're excited about uh, in the medical field ah. that you think is like interesting, fun and cool that either we haven't talked about or, or folks aren't talking about enough. Is it okay to do something uh, kind of wonky dorky? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cause we talked about this before and I know that this is a very niche kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but the way scientists generally work when we're not in a pandemic is that we, we have our big projects that are, you know, NIH funded grants that are multi-million dollar projects. And you're, you're constantly doing smaller pieces of that work and publishing. 
And, um, and part of that is presenting your findings at conferences. We all go to national conferences. So you go to maybe two or three really big conferences a year and you get a snapshot of what the international community of scientists, right? If you're a real scientist, there are no national borders. There's no, we are all one. Right. You go to these conferences and you walk through a conference hall with posters and everybody has kind of their latest findings which in reality is their latest contribution to all of human knowledge on this topic, right? That's what we do. These posters are so complicated and complex that they're hard to read right now. They, everybody tries to fit all this information in 12 point font on a three foot by four foot poster. And the person presenting stands there like this in front of their poster for two hours and is like, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah. So when you're walking by, the anxiety, because a lot of people are introverts in this field, the anxiety of like actually stopping and reading their poster while they're like, you know, um, <laughs> they're there. so excited about what they did, right? And they desperately want to talk to you. The problem is, is that the first time you ask a question, you get into this big conversation with them that lasts like 20 minutes, yeah. but the poster conference is only an hour. So now you got to like zoom through all of these other things, right? And maybe somewhere on the ninth row of posters, there's some little thing that makes you go, that's the missing yeah. link in my conceptual model. Oh yeah. my God, that's what's missing from our cancer research, right? And you miss it yeah. because you talk to the one person that you stop to talk to and you're just kind of mentally drained. So there is this new move to change how we create academic posters and to be able to synthesize all of the most important things in your research to one simple sentence. Mm. That is like, in my case, you know, focusing on providers sense of purpose helps mm. alleviate burnout. Mm. If you can bring all of this really like wonky nerd space thoughts down to something that makes sense in a single sentence, then you're doing it right. Right. Because frankly, too many of us, too many scientists and too many researchers get into this weird masturbatory loop of like creating more and more complex shit that's supposed to impress ourselves and our, you know, and our peers and get us funding, but doesn't actually improve human life. Mm. And I think we need to take our ego and the hierarchy out of it and embrace things that make it as simple as possible to explain why a vaccine is acceptable, to explain why, you know, how we help providers in a pandemic, all of these things. Um, and so the new poster format is just that single sentence with a QR code to a paper if you want it. Mm. Um, and then I'm standing here if you want to talk to me. And mm. that way you can like run through these conferences very quickly. Mm. Um, and it's not mentally as taxing. Right. So that's a super nerdy thing, but I'm very much in favor of it. Um, I'm going to add a link to the guy who invented it, um, along with some of my information on my social media um, pages. So if anybody's interested, go to Theory Generator Playground or at TG Playground on Facebook, and I, I put all sorts of info on there. So anyway. Is that, is that how pe folks can reach you? Sure. So um, yeah, so my research collective has the Facebook page, and it's at TG Playground. Um, and it's for Theory Generator Playground. We also have a YouTube channel where I, I upload videos that are about research, but also kind of everything I always wanted to know and, and never knew how to ask, like what's the difference between a resume and a CV? And mm -hmm. when is which kind appropriate, mm -hmm. right? Or like, how do I answer a multiple choice question? Mm -hmm. Or how do I answer like a narrative response question? Things that um, you know, if you've never had anybody sit you down and talk to you about how there's an actual algorithm for answering multiple choice questions that might be helpful, um, mm. then maybe that would be that would be good for students. Mm. So, and you're also on LinkedIn, right? Folks can find you. I am on LinkedIn, but uh, you know, that's just kind of the professional braggy stuff. And so, um, but yeah, I think I'm uh, Adrian Martinez Hollingsworth, and it's got my credentials, which is like. PhD, MSN, RN, PHN. The PHN is a public health nurse certification, uh, by the way. Oh, PHN. So, um, which just like all the other public health nurses, I was a little concerned at the beginning of the pandemic because I believe technically they can just call us in. You're kind of like a reservist. And so I was waiting to hear just in case. But what they did instead was they um, created a, a core that you could sign into voluntarily, hmm. um, which I did and I know a lot of other nurses did to be deployed uh, anywhere in California that you're needed. Mm. Mm. Um, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but we were talking a little bit before 
the the show started and you know thinking about this small axe small axes um mm -hmm. you were talking about billionaires and, and maybe taxing billionaires more i was <laughs> yeah hell yeah and we and right because medicine is economics and uh it's all interconnected with race class and gender if there's 99% of folks that are not uber wealthy and all those folks are small acts, why, why don't we see a bigger push in policy changes? And, and I guess why hasn't it happened sooner? I think we think too small. Mm. I think that the, the best comparison here is climate change. Mm. You know, when we were forced to stay home during the social distancing, we should have seen the earth recover more than it has. Yeah. Um, because our expectation was that individual family households were contributing to our, you know, our global warming in a measurable amount. But it sure didn't make that big of a difference when we were all forced in the most severe restricted way to not drive to not like, you know, burn things like, Obviously, the individual is not the answer. The mm. big business corporations that are polluters is the answer because, yep. man, if the little guy mattered, then things would have gotten better. Yeah. Right. And it was such a, you know, it was such a like artificial experiment, you know, that happened and we weren't expecting it. And I think the same is true in terms of our being able to address our social inequities with, um, you know, with taxation of the little guy and with preventing us from getting stimulus checks little things like that if it were enough then we should all think about doing it but in reality the people who hold the majority of the resources are the ones that should be contributing more um so on our level on the small guy level what we have to give is kindness and hope yeah you know and i think if we can share that with each other as much as possible that is our little axe that right. is going to help right Right, and even and even voting, right? Because there's more of us, and Absolutely. and we saw folks coming out in droves in in Arizona and Georgia. It was amazing. Voting is the purest expression of hope. Interesting. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Hashtag no. I'm just no I like purest expression of hope. Wow. Because no, but you're right, right? Because if if I stop eating beef and you stop eating beef, that's really really good. But if the beef producer starts doing some other business then it's even better and if amazon and google stop shooting out so much co2 into the atmosphere it would be even better than you and i not driving a car if a tech genius decides he wants to focus all of his energy on creating a new type of non-meat and right. market it with his millions and millions that right. sure works more effectively than me cooking vegetarian for my husband every day <laughs> i do it but like that sure made a big difference quick didn't it <laughs> so you you know, rub shoulders with with some folks that are very um, influential and high up there. And so you know how some of these folks think. I read an article that the US government or, or just the US economy lost $16 trillion from racism like last year. If some of these folks that we rub elbows with are not uh, moved by a morality argument, or a big heart argument that cops killing black folks or you know covid killing predominantly communities of color if the morality argument doesn't push people why is the capitalist argument to uh, you know spike lee do the right thing why is that why is the capitalist argument not moving more folks to change i'm going to drop some scary stuff on you right now yeah. um, the first thing is the the eternal conundrum, which is like, I don't know how to teach you that you need to care about other people. Right. That's empathy that we need to instill very young. And right. it's nothing I can do on the back end for 50 year olds. Right. But everybody's saying the economy is bad. And I almost am hesitant to say this publicly, but I am going to because I think it's important. Hmm. Since Donald Trump got in office, um, the economy has not been bad for some people. Right. And even during COVID, so we started my daughter's education fund about a year ago with some of the proceeds of a house sale that we did. Hmm. Um, and in a year, now a year and a month, 
um, her college fund has increased by $37,000. Wow. The stock market, certain aspects of the stock market are doing very well. And we have consistently seen gains in our personal wealth because of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's terrible. I don't have that sort of a fund for anything other than my daughter's college because I feel also like it's immoral. But um, family members that are are wealthy of uh, you know extended family have also seen tremendous financial gains during this time. Right. So when you say that the capitalist argument isn't working, I mean capitalism's working very well for some people right now. Right. They happen to be the people in power who have you know kind of historic wealth, and um, and we still are very much an oligarchy in that sense. We need to get real about the fact that a small number of families really control the majority of how we all live. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons I was talking to you that we take our philanthropic responsibilities so seriously because how much goddamn money do you need? Mm. You know, I mean, having come from kind of where I've come from, I'm already doing better than I ever thought I could. Mm. And, um, and there's a lot of evidence that shows that when you make more than $80,000 a year, it doesn't substantively impact your happiness. Mm. Right. So, right. You know, right. I love us to get better about understanding, like, how much do I need to live and how much do I need to be comfortable and have a cushion and everything else should be considered surplus. Mm. And surplus belongs to all of us. Mm hmm right mm -hmm. so and it's it's weird scary uncomfortable stuff and we need to talk about money more god damn it we need yeah, to talk yeah. about how much yeah. people make yeah. we need to talk about how much people should be making yeah. acting like it's a taboo subject doesn't help anybody except no. the people at the top no no it, it correct and i was reading this article forbes richest families in america number one walton family yeah. walmart right walton walmart uh number two Coke, Coke Brothers, right? And number three, Mars, Mars and Mars, M and M, right? Snickers, yeah. M and M. Yeah. These three families together um, make three hundred eighty-four billion dollars. I don't know annually. And are totally subsidized for their workers who mm -hmm. live on minimum wage and below minimum wage standards by all of us. Right, 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 and and, and right, and and the reason that we need to talk more about economics both in the medical field and every field is because it's tied into race class gender and everything and we're not saying these people are terrible people and they should you know uh jump off a cliff we should be taxing just a little more of that 384 billion which would help everybody maybe even including yeah. themselves yeah um, free reagan economics would solve a lot of our problems yeah. but you know the other thing that i think is concerning is that it's it's a little questionable when people of color start making money to all of a sudden say, hey, you know, it's immoral and you got to give back. It's like when we started trying to put all these environmental restrictions on China, right when they were starting to really come up mm. uh, as, you know, an industrial power. We were like, oh, you got to be careful, you know, ozone layer. And they're like, dude, what? You never cared. And now all of a sudden, because I'm doing it, it's a problem. Right. So we have to be careful because I don't like to shame people who've worked really hard to come up. Right. Um, and I believe in a brand of socialism where we're still allowed to have cocktail parties and own jewelry and like people are allowed to be comfortable. And I think we need to connect that. So right. it's not this, you need to be this like ascetic, like, you know, mourner right. and that's how we survive. It's like, how do we all live comfortably and at the very bottom lift it up? Right, right, right. And hundred percent. And I wish media would focus more on Finland, Sweden, Norway, Germany, France. These places are not only socialists, right? No, they talk about South America. It's easier for their argument. Right, correct, correct, right. It's a mixed economy and it's probably always gonna be a mixed economy, meaning capitalism and socialism, because we do have socialism already with public schools, public housing. Yeah, socialism for wealthy people. We have Martin Luther King, socialism for wealthy people. You know, the larger thing here, though, Zach, for me is that I, you know, I spend 80% of my time honestly thinking and 20% right. writing and doing projects, right? Not everybody has time to no. think about all of these abstract concepts and to research them and think about labor history and like think about what has worked and why unions are important. Like, 
people don't have headspace for this. Right. So it's on us as educators and artists yes. to create palatable stuff that fits on a sticker yep. that at least brings awareness. So if they want to look up more, they can, right. but you know, they got to get back to their Uber job or whatever. Yep. yep. Right. Yep. And I, I think we get, you know, our heads are just like too far up our own asses <laughs> sometimes. So we can't talk to the average person totally. who's not like exhausted. If it takes five minutes for you to, you to explain why Venezuela is not the model of socialism. You right. know what right. I mean? Right. No, totally. And that's, and, and so let's, so let's close on that in this notion of <laughs> when you go to the science fair, we should all be thinking of that, that one sentence of, okay, you're a genius and you did all this stuff. What do you want me to do? And what should I take from this? And what's one act or one way I can vote or something I can do to help yeah. change this? I mean, if you're talking about scientists, you know, the NIH, um, so Latinos make up about 17% of the US population, but they account for 1% of participants in randomized control trials wow. funded by the NIH, right? Wow. Um, and even fewer than that 1%, it's like 1% or I'm sorry, 2% of that 1% are studies that are specifically about Latinos. Mm. So if you do a science fair and you're studying something and you're looking at social determinants of health or health disparity, grab that info and put it on your poster. Right. It's right. systematically underfunded by NIH and that's one of the reasons it's important. Mm. Here's all of the other scientific reasons it's important, right? But mesh money and politics and science and education, make it all one thing because that's how it's living. It's all one thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really on us to make that clear for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And in the spirit of uh, the holidays and Hanukkah and Christmas, you know, you're talking about Jesus and one can even say, you know, Prophet Muhammad with the Hadith, they did amazing things, even the Maccabees, but it was the, the viewers, right? The viewers and the seeing of those good deeds or those mitzvot that, uh, that made people want to to do that in their own lives. So hopefully we've had viewers today that um, have been moved by your stories and your, your facts and, uh, and your lived experience. So thank you so much for being on the program. Um, Spotlight series continues um, uh, on, in the coming weeks. And we're not going to take a break uh, for the holidays. So we're gonna keep rolling through um, on Sundays and, and, and Fridays and tune in. You can find out more information, communityworksinstitute.org. Joe Brooks uh, has a lot of cool stuff cooking up for everybody. And uh, I'll, I'll see you next Sunday. And thank you again, Dr. Martinez for joining us. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. <laughs>